Romans chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. That's what we're going to be considering this morning. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We'll read it together. It's a letter that Paul has written uh, to the Christians in Rome. And he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. That's where we're going to finish uh, our reading. So, can we maybe turn this down just a wee bit? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. I might get louder, is the thing. Not Andy loud, but a little bit louder. Thanks. If I asked you, what are you living for? I wonder what your answer would be to that question this morning. I reckon if we went around Grace Mount this morning, we'd get a whole bunch of different answers. Some people would say, uh, I'm living for the weekend. Maybe that's been us at times. I think some people would say to us, I'm living for retirement. Some people would say, I'm living for my kids. Some people would say, I'm living for my next fix. Other people would say, I'm just living for the moment. I think for the past few weeks, uh, there's been a bunch of people living for football, taking in every single minute of the Euros, cheering on every goal, uh, probably except before last night, for a lot of folk. I was kind of hoping that our baby would arrive so that I'd have a couple of weeks to spend watching uh, the Euros for myself, which sounds daft, but some people really do take time off work so they can sit and watch every minute of every game of these major tournaments. Because it's interesting, isn't it? That you can only really wholeheartedly, totally be devoted to one thing at a time. I got a silly message through on a WhatsApp group the other week uh, that says this. This may be of interest to one of you. A friend of mine has two tickets in a corporate box for England v Scotland. He paid £300 each, but he didn't realise when he bought them that it was going to be the same day as his COVID-19 postponed wedding. If you're interested, he's looking for someone to take his place. It's at Hamilton Registry Office at 2.30pm. The bride's name is Moira, she's 5 foot 4, has her own income and is a really good cook. Now, it's tongue-in-cheek, but you get the point. It's one or the other. Complete devotion is either going to look like sacking off the football so you can go and marry the love of your life, or ditching her, painting a soul tire on your face, and going and standing in this stadium full of other people watching this board draw. It's one or the other. Jesus spoke about this uh, in a different way with a bit less misogyny. He said... No one can serve two masters. Either you'll love the one and hate the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. See, we can only really live wholeheartedly for one thing. And what we're going to see this morning in Romans is that in the gospel, God demands that the thing we live for be Him. Wholeheartedly. That we give ourselves entirely to Him. And so the challenge for all of us this morning is going to be this. Am I willing to do that? It's a challenge for those of us who are openly living every day for other things. Am I going to be willing to give all of that away and live only for Jesus? Because this Jesus stuff can't just be a tag on to our life as it is. In the book of Matthew, we find this rich young guy coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I keep all of the commandments, but what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, go, sell everything that you have, and then give all the money away to the poor. Then come and follow me. See, Jesus knew that the one thing this young guy wasn't willing to give up was his money. And the young man goes away from Jesus with all his money still in his bank, but sad. The question is, what 
Will you give yourself to? That's what Jesus was really asking. Me or something else? What's it going to be? But it's also going to be a challenge for those of us who would answer that question at the start with, well, I'm living for God. Because really, are you wholeheartedly giving him everything? We read about a king of God's people in the Old Testament called Amaziah. And the Bible says this about Amaziah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with his whole heart. Does that describe you? Because it's serious. Amaziah gets destroyed. And this has massive implications for every part of our lives. What has your devotion? What are you living for? Now, as we come to Romans 12, it's really like we're cutting into the middle of a movie because there's 11 chapters that have gone before. And I've got this picture on uh, the wall above my desk of uh, the fourth road bridge and the fourth rail bridge at night, stretching out across the Firth of Forth, connecting these two big lumps of land that are Fife and the Lothians. And the first word here in Romans 12 is really a bit like that. It's a bridge. It's connecting these two big lumps of letter, chapters 1 to 11, to chapters 12 to 16, that are meant to be joined together. It's therefore, it's going to point us back, and then it's going to demand something of us in light of what we've seen. So here's our first point, if you're taking notes. Look at everything God's given to you. Verse 1, therefore, Paul says, in view of God's mercy. Chapters 1 to 11 of the book of Romans contains this unfolding masterpiece of what God has done in his plan of salvation. To to take hell-bound, guilty sinners, rescue them from sin and death and give them eternal life. Starts in chapter 1. It says, the wrath of God is is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. That was us. Under this uh, condemnation, under this wrath of God, all have sinned, chapter 3 says, and fall short of the glory of God, without exception. And surely, from experience, we we know that is true. That is true. On to chapter 5. But God... We read it earlier. Demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it. While we were in our sin, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, chapter 6 reminds us. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We deserve death for the way we have lived. But God graciously gives to us eternal life. We saw last week in chapter 8, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? It's so rich. It's so full. There's nothing lacking in what God has given to us. And Paul here in chapters 1 to 11 of Romans is holding up the gospel like a giant diamond. He's letting the light shine through every side and facet of it. This is what God's done for us. Romans 9.16 It depends not on human will or exertion but on God who has mercy. This is Paul's theme in chapters 1 to 11. What God has done for us on our behalf to make us right in his sight. And though now Paul's going to turn his attention to what we must do, the way we must live, the gospel's demands on us, this is always the order of things. So get it straight in our heads. What God has done for us when we were dead in our sin always comes first. Think back to the start of the Bible. God creates the first human beings from dust. Then he gives them a way that they should live. What God does first is give them life. Then he gives them a way to live. Without God doing something only he could do, Adam would have been dust. Or think to God's people in the Old Testament when they were slaves in Egypt. Completely hopeless, unable to free themselves. Then God rescues them from their slave masters. He makes a way through the Red Sea. He delivers them from the pursuing Egyptians. Only then do they come to Mount Sinai where he gives them a way they should live. In the Ten Commandments. 
It's always that way. It's always been the same. God gives freedom and life. Then he gives us a way we should live. God does something for us in his mercy. He gives us eternal life when we only deserve death. Everything we have is given to us in mercy. That's chapters 1 to 11. Therefore, chapter 12. And this is our second heading. Therefore, it's only proper for us to give everything to him. Look at again verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is the proper response to chapters 1 to 11. In view of masses of mercy, this is the only reasonable action for us to take. Paul's saying, look at everything God's given to you. Stare at it. Fix your eyes on it. Now it is only reasonable you give everything to him. It's not just a suggestion. This is an essential response. This is right. We can feel this is right. What we've seen in these 11 chapters of mind-blowing mercy has got to change the way we live. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, on the news this week the story of our former health secretary's extramarital affair with one of his aides. It's not right for us to revel in what happened there. But surely one of the things that ought to make us deeply uncomfortable about the whole thing, COVID completely aside, is the way that he's dealt with his wife. Listen to what he said uh, only a year or so ago. Martha, that's his wife, has borne the brunt of it. Thank God Martha is totally wonderful in looking after the children and looking after me, and it's really tough. Now to repay that with an affair, we surely know and sense deep down is just so wrong. She's given everything. He should have been completely devoted to him. That's how ugly it is when we look at the mercy God has poured out on us and then choose to live for ourselves instead of for him. In view of his mercy, come on. We've got to do this. As we look at the mercy God has shown to us, we've got to give him everything. Look more closely at this. If you're taking notes, here's some subpoints. Okay, subpoint one. We must offer every part of us. It says, offer your bodies. Now, bodies here is used to speak of the entirety of us, all of us, okay? But it's interesting that the focus here is on what's physical. And it's here, really, that objections can start to arise because it kind of rubs us up the wrong way. Because we live in a world where people want autonomy over their own bodies. We, we teach our children at school songs like my body's nobody's body but mine. That gets deep down into our psyche as humans as well. It's up to me if I want to abuse my body with drunk drugs and drink. It's my choice, my body. It's up to me if I want to stuff myself with junk food every day, clog up my arteries. My body, my choice. No one can tell me who I can join my body to. I can sleep with whoever I like because it's mine. God can have this sort of spiritual part of me, but my body, doesn't, that doesn't really matter. It's, it's mine. The Bible says that your body, along with the rest of you, was destined for decay in the ground and eternity in hell before God stepped in and rescued the whole of you, promising to raise your body to new life in Christ, to live physically forever with the nail-pierced, physical, risen Jesus. God has bought your body along with the rest of you. We've been saved as whole physical people, so the whole of us needs to be offered to God. It matters, therefore, what you do with your eyes. In the middle of the night, we, where we use our eyes to be busy with pornography when God has purchased them from darkness. We must offer our eyes to God. Open my eyes, we prayed earlier, that I may behold wonderful things in your law. Our eyes must be offered to Him. 
It matters what we do with our ears. When it comes to things like gossip at the school gates. Will we, will we listen to sound teaching from the word of God? Or will we find people who are going to tell us what we want to hear? Will we be ready to listen to the cry of the poor so that we can help? It matters. It matters what we do with our mouths. God has bought back our mouths to speak blessing instead of curse. To speak truth instead of lies. To speak prayers to him instead of grumbling. He's given us a new song to sing and a good news to declare. It matters what we do with our hands. We shouldn't be idle or lazy. Whatever work we have to do, we should do as this offering to God. They should be lifted up in prayer, stretched out to the needy, ready to comfort the grieving. It matters. It matters what we do with our feet, where we go, the people that we go towards. The Bible says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. It matters. The right response to everything God's given us in giving uh, is giving every part of us to him. Sub point two, we must also offer every moment to him. Look at verse one again. This is a living sacrifice. Now that sounds bizarre because sacrifices in the Old Testament were dead things. An animal that's killed, that's laid on an altar to be consumed totally by fire. But here it's a living sacrifice. It's not one and done. It's not a new sacrifice of death. Jesus has done that in paying once for all for our sins. This is life that we don't deserve. That's to be lived out for the one who gave us it. We're to present ourselves to God. Paul says earlier in Romans, as those who have been made alive from the dead. This is a living sacrifice because God has already made us alive. Day by day, we're to live, therefore, on the altar. Moment by moment, this is part of our true and proper worship. So that means when we leave this place today, at the end of our Sunday worship service, our worship does not end. It means Monday to Saturday are six days of worship as we live on the altar. Every part of us, at every moment, offered to God. Now that's a tall order. But here's the thing. Sub point three. We have everything we need to be holy and pleasing to God. It's possible. Paul's not asking us to do something we cannot do. When he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We're not meant to then despair about its difficulty. We're meant to be amazed that sinful people like us could be holy and pleasing to God. It's meant to amaze us. This shouldn't be. But the Bible says it is. None is righteous, no, not one. No one does good, not even one. That's what it says in chapter 3. But God, in his mercy, makes us holy in his sight and gives us the power of his spirit. To live in a way that is holy and pleasing to him. Don't you want that? We can please our maker who has saved us from sin's guilt and power. We have everything we need to do it because he gave it to us. Last sub point. This is just a no brainer. That's not a lead into my sub point. That's the sub point. It just makes sense. It's right. On the basis of chapter 1 to 11, there's just no arguing that this is right. Chapter 12, verse 1 is heavy on demand. It is. I don't argue with you there. But there's just no denying that on the basis of God's mercy, this is entirely reasonable. So the question really is, do you believe chapters 1 to 11? Do you believe God's mercy... That we were hopelessly sinful, but God saved us by the blood of Jesus. If you're new to church and you're just getting to know what the Bible has to say about the gospel, you've got to make a decision. Do you believe that what it claims is true? If you've grown up in church, you've heard this a million times. 
Do you believe for yourself that this is true? Is it good news or not? If you've been a Christian for years and years and years and you just don't doubt the truth of what God has set, said about what he's done for us in chapters 1 to 11, then are you living in a way that gives everything to him? Because if you believe what God's done for us, the only reasonable thing for us to do is to offer our bodies a living sacrifice to him. Don't live like the ugliness of an ungrateful, adulterous spouse. And if you don't believe this message this morning, then live for yourself. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you may die. But know this, freedom from the mastery of God does not make you in control. The Bible says you aren't free, you're a slave to your sin. And you've experienced that that is true. Even if you wanted to live a holy life, you can't. You will go back to your sin again and again and again to things that are harmful, to things that bring despair. And you can serve only one master. Sin will rule in your life, bringing you only hardship and judgment. Or you can be purchased by God, who as you live for him will work everything together for your good. It's one or the other. I know which master I have chosen to live for. But we've got to pause here. Because our experience speaks of something other than all of us, every minute, being given as a holy sacrifice to God. How many of us could honestly say, yep, that's the way I live. Every minute of every day, every part of me. And that's where this passage gets really realistic as we head into verse 2. Because point 3, there's competition for your everything. The, body doesn't shy, the Bible doesn't shy away from that. Paul says, there, do not conform to the pattern of this world. When we become Christians, we don't then go around floating in the air, dressed in white, like some sort of new perfect creature. I think that's clear when you look at me. It's not what happens. We're still here in the world, still here where we were before. We have been changed. God has done something. He's made us right in his sight. And he has called us to a life of holiness and sacrifice to him. But the world around us can still seem so alluring, can't it? It can still look so good. And it will compete for every part of us. The picture here is of, of wet clay being squeezed into a mold into a shape so that we look like the world sound no different speak no different think no different there's loads of moulds that the world would compete to squeeze us into it might be the mould of money living life to move on uh, up and out earning more and more and giving less and less could be the mould of bitterness and anger Never grateful for what we have, consumed with what people have done to us, and consumed with what people have never done for us. Maybe it's the mold of pleasure, feeling good, chasing that high, willing to do whatever it takes to get that next feeling, the next high, the next binge, the next purchase online. Could be the mold of obsessive productivity, it could be pride. It could be selfishness. It could be the mold of hopeless despair. We know, don't we? There's all number of things that are wrong, that look like the world, but that the world would love to squeeze us into the shape of. But as Christians in the world, we aren't to fit into its mold. Instead, fourthly, there's a way for you to be transformed in your everything. Look at verse 2. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When Jesus left to go to heaven, he left his followers in the world with the purpose of looking different. Listen to what we were before, the, before God stepped in and saved us. Romans 1. We exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. And since we didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave us up to a debased mind. 
But in the gospel, we find there's a way for that to be reversed, transformed. Foolish worship is replaced with true and proper worship. A debased, corrupt mind is renewed. And it's through this renewing of our minds, Paul says, that we are gradually transformed. In Luke chapter 9, we find Jesus going up on a mountain with some of his disciples. And they see him transfigured before them. Shining white. They got a glimpse into his glory. And that's what we're to be in the world. The language is the same. We're not to fit into the mold of this world. We're to look like Jesus and radiate his glory. That's the calling on our lives as Christians. And why does that happen through the renewing of our minds? Well, think back to Romans 8 last week. The way we think about God changes the way we live. A new way of thinking changes our conduct. And bit by bit, daily being renewed as we think on the mercy of God as shown to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ, we will be transformed. It might not be swift, but it will be sure. And as we finish the second half of verse 2, we get a then. And a then means there's a conclusion coming. Then, point five, you'll experience that God's ways are better than anything. Think back a few weeks to when we looked at God's will in 1 Thessalonians. God has given us life, and then God has clearly made known to us how he wants us to live. It's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. It's the way we'll live in eternity when we're finally free from sin completely and we get to experience something of that now. As we live this life of all-out devotion towards God who has lavished mercy on us, living in this world, renewed day by day, being these transformed sort of radiators of the glory of Christ, we get to prove the goodness of God in the way he's called us to live. There's nothing arbitrary or pointless about the way God calls us to live. It's actually the best. I don't know if uh, Asda still do this. They used to have a little guarantee thing on their own brand products. It said, try me, you'll love me, or your money back. Don't be like that rich young man who kept hold of his money and walked away from Jesus sad. You will never, ever, ever regret giving everything for Jesus. Experience the goodness of living in a way that pleases God. And that won't just be obvious to you, by the way. There's something unavoidably beautiful about complete devotion. Just a couple of months ago, uh, a lady in our old church died. It's funny, when you, when you leave a church, people start dying. <laughs> don't know, that might just be me. As long as I can remember, she'd been bedbound with late-stage dementia. And um, her husband, he was an older man himself, he had faithfully, tenderly cared for her every minute of every day for year after year after year. He didn't do it begrudgingly at all. Never complained about it. When I visited their wee flat, he'd stroke his wife's head. She was unresponsive. He was completely, lovingly devoted to her. It was obvious. It was beautiful. And it made me want to be a husband like that. And living in this way that Romans 12 calls us to live, in wholehearted devotion to a God who's shown us such mercy will prove his goodness not just to us but to people around us. People will say, what has made them like that? And we can say, my God has shown such amazing mercy to me.